song to sing reminding us of what we believe uh, for thousands of years, right? The Christian church have, that's a creed of what their faith is in, what they believe. And so churches all over the world are gathered together, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And that song is a reminder of what we believe as a church. It's a wonderful song. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you again for this gathering of saints and friends who are here today to worship you, to hear your word uh, preached and taught to us. And so may it be a wonderful time of benefit for us spiritually, but may it also be a, a time that you are glorified with our response to what we hear. May you be worshiped and praised in all that you do and what you're going to do today in this service, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, would you walk around and greet one another to Calvary Baptist and welcome people to church? Oh, Katie's so cute.
All righty, let's get together here. It's Time later on in our fellowship to uh, down later downstairs later on. Be plenty of time to have fellowship. Let's gather back in our seats and continue worshiping the Lord when Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of me. Watching. How's everybody doing this morning? What's that? Good. I hope so. I hope you're all doing better than good. Hope you're doing great. Did you all see the Christmas tree in the parking lot? <laughs> you did. You saw it. It was be- it's beautiful, isn't it? It's not going to stay like that, though. It's actually going to turn further brown, and it's eventually going, the leaves are all going to fall off of it, and it's going to die. Actually, it's dead right now. You just can't, you just don't know it right? 
But that was a surprise. Pete called me yesterday and told me about it. And praise the Lord, no cars were there. Nothing was in the parking lot at the time that it fell. Normally there would be cars there. So we give God praise that no one got hurt. That would be uh, probably would have made it in the news. And then we would have a different kind of a service this morning, I would think. Well, praise the Lord, we didn't have that happen. So I'm glad you're all here. And uh, we are continuing our time here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I will be teaching from verses 35 through 49. I had tried to cover the rest of this chapter in one sermon, but I said, no, can't do it. So I'm just going to give you verses 35 to 49 this morning. Wet your appetite for verses 50 to 58. Today we're going to talk about a subject that I believe ought to be, it should be, appealing to everybody here, whether you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or whether you don't know Him. Uh, it ought to be appealing. Whether you are young and just with all the energy and ready to rock and roll or you are maybe old or think you're old, uh, for those who, who are old or think they're old, this message is much more appealing, and uh, we're going to be talking about this morning about the body that you've always wanted. The body that you've always wanted. Well, maybe not exactly, but we are going to be talking about the body that we all are longing for, because as Christians, as Christians, we long for the day that the Lord Jesus Christ gives that shout that trumpet, the voice, and he calls us, and the dead in Christ shall be raised, and we shall be with the Lord forever and ever. He will give us a new glorious body. These bodies that we have now are only temporary. You know, I don't think we all believe that, though, because if we're honest, most of us spend a lot of time worried about, right, um, all the details of focusing on this body that we have right now. And listen, I'm not saying you shouldn't take care of yourself. Don't give up like, you know, oh, I didn't give up. I still, I still wrestle and fight, right? I'm still trying. But sometimes people just give up on their bodies. We ought not to do that. The Scriptures teach us that, that bodily exercise profits what? Little, right? If you know the Scriptures, they profit little. So it, it's good to do some form of exercising and take care of your body because our bodies now, if you're a believer in Jesus, they are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God cares about our bodies. He wants us to take care of them as well, right? And so these bodies are important, but if we're honest, and, and you know it, you know, the, the pictures that are out there, the TV, everything is just glamorizing the, the bodies that we have today, and, and it's, the focus is all on that. And as believers, we can get caught up and, and being unbalanced in that and spending so much time worried about these bodies that we realize that they only profit little, bodily exercise profits little, but godliness, godliness is profitable for all, for all. Paul is teaching us in this text that we're looking at that there is a day that is coming. There's a day that is coming. The, the end is near. The end is near. That moment that has been promised by the Lord is going to take place when Jesus will make all of his enemies submit to his lordship and he will reign supreme over all. The kingdom of God that the scriptures talk about over and over again, that now we experience the kingdom of God in part, in part, or the promise that we read over and over again of the kingdom of God to come is finally going to be here. We're going to see the kingdom of God. And we who know the Lord shall experience a glorious, glorious transformation where the Lord gives us our resurrected bodies, our glorious resurrected bodies. And so that is the matter of discussion this morning. That is what I like to turn your attention to as I read verses 35 through 49. So if you have your copy of Scriptures, follow along as I read these verses. 
Well, someone will say, and uh, just by reminding us that Paul is answering questions that have come from the Corinthians. And so this is, these are questions that have come to him. But someone will say, how are the dead raised and with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, man, the last Adam became a life-given spirit. However, the spiritual was not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of the dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are, uh, who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also Bear the image of the heavenly man. Father, I ask that you would grant us all understanding. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand the truth of thy word today. May you help me to teach. Give each one ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand, so that we may benefit spiritually from this passage of Scripture, and may this time glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. And so Paul is asked, it's answering questions as you see here from verse 35. The Corinthians ask two questions. How are the dead raised up? And the second question is, and with what body do they come? So those are the two questions that are asked. And throughout the remaining verses from verse 36 all the way to verse 57, Paul is going to answer those two questions. And they're going to be, he's going to take the questions in reverse. He's going to answer the, the second question first, with what body do they come? And that is the question that's on people's mind. What kind of body are we going to have in our resurrected body? So Paul is going to handle that question first. And then kind of intermingled throughout this chapter, he's going to drop little hints of how the body is going to be raised up from the dead. Now, in answering these questions, what kind of bodies we will have, Paul is going to lay out a principle that he believes ought to be obvious to the Corinthians. That is why he says there in 36, foolish one. Because it should be obvious from the principle of sowing a seed of what kind of body we should have. Jesus would also use that same phrase, foolish ones. As he was walking after he rose again from the dead and he was walking down the road, uh, other disciples were walking down the road with him and they did not understand who he was. They didn't understand the times that they were in and they didn't understand who he was and why he came and what his death meant and anything like that. And he called them all foolish ones because they should have known from the scriptures what was obvious. And Paul is saying the same thing to the Corinthians, that it should be obvious what kind of body we're going to have when we are raised again from the dead. And that's the problem the Corinthians had. In verse 12, 
Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? They could not fathom the idea that there was going to be a resurrection of the dead because of the way the body is material and it will decay. How in the world is God going to do this? And so they could not connect it. They could not understand it. They were thinking more from their Greek mind and not from the Scriptures what the scriptures were teaching. And so, in answering what kind of bodies we will have, he's going to lay out this principle of sowing a seed. Let me read it again from verses 36 through 38. Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless what? Unless it dies. Unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be. What you put in the ground is not going to be the same thing that comes out. First, it has to die, and what you put in the ground is not going to be the same thing that comes out. And how can God do this? God gives it a body as He pleases. That's how He answers that question. God gives it a body as He pleases, and to each seed, His own body. And so, He says, a seed is like our bodies. A seed is like our bodies that will be changed into a new body based on the principle of sowing a seed. And what is that principle? A seed that is planted in the ground. It must die before it can be changed into that glorious green plant that comes out of the ground. You look at that seed and you say, how in the world does that happen, right? A seed to our eyes is nothing. It's just a seed. But when it's placed into the ground, it has to spend time in that ground. And while it's in the ground, it changes. And out of that seed comes a glorious, glorious and that's the same thing that God does with our bodies. A wonderful, wonderful truth God is going to use. And listen, God takes the present bodies that we have. They must die. They are placed in the ground. And from that same body, God is going to create a glorious new resurrected body, one that will be like His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in order for that new life, in order for that, for that new body to come, the principle here is that it must die first. It must die first. You know, think about that. Spiritual growth, any kind of change in our life, there's the same principle that is there. Just like the seed that must be placed into the ground and it must die before new life is brought, the same thing must happen in your life and my life. Not so much, not just the resurrected body, but even our own spiritual growth. It's not going to happen unless something dies. Let me, let, me, let me prove that to you. Jesus said a similar thing in John chapter 12, but here he's referring to his life, that he, he has to die. And when he dies from his death, it's going to come a glorious change in a whole bunch of people who decide to follow him. But he must die first for that change to take place. Listen to what he says here. John chapter 12, but Jesus answered and said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, here's the principle, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus is talking about his own life, but he's also talking about everyone who follows him. He said, if I don't die, if I don't get placed into the grave, I won't rise again from the dead and then you will not have any kind of spiritual benefit. But in the same token, look what he continues to say. Verse 25, He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. He's talking about spiritual growth there. He's talking about even spiritual life. If you want to see your life change, if you want to see yourself become like Christ, a death must take place in your life. What kind of death is that? A dying to yourself. A dying to yourself. We need to die to ourselves, to what we want to do with our lives. We need to die to ourselves or we will never see Christ-likeness happen in this life. Spiritual growth Becoming more like Christ begins when we humble ourselves and we pick up the cross and we follow Christ. We have to die to ourselves. So unless we surrender to the will of the Lord 
in the use of our time, right? The priorities that we make. We need to surrender the use of our time to the Lord, the use of our talents and the gifts that He's given to us. God has blessed each one of us with gifts and talents. Every one of us have different types of talents and different types of gifts that He's given to you. And He wants you to use them for, for His glory and His honor. But in order for you to do that, some of us need to die to ourselves because we're using what all those blessings for our own enjoyment and not for the glory of God. Many of us are guilty in that matter. And then not only our time and talents, but I say this over and over again, our treasures, our finances, the things that we have, the things that we work hard for every week and we get that paycheck. How do we use that? How does that show that we are growing in the Lord? And sometimes we use it for our own agenda to advance our own desires and our own kingdom. And God says we need to die to ourselves for spiritual growth to take place or we will not see Christ's likeness. Wow. Not only that, you can say amen, by the way. Oh, 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 oh me. Or you could, say, oh, you could say amen. Hey, can you turn that heat down, by the way? I'm hot. I'm sure everybody else is hot. It's a little warm in here. All right? Oh, it's good that you guys are laughing. I get one joke out there. All right, good. I'm going to get that one out of the way, you know? Hey, look at verse 37. It's kind of hard to understand. He says, in what you sow... You do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. You know, in the Corinthians' mind, maybe in your mind, just think about this for a second. It, it's somewhat hard to understand in our minds how a body that has been in the grave, decaying, perhaps maybe for a little while or for decades, just decaying, how God can take that body that same body, and gloriously transform it into a resurrected body. And that's what God can do. It's, just, it's got to die first. It, what goes into the ground is not like the same thing that comes out, but they're related. And then he says this, but God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. That reminds me of creation, that God spoke the world into existence. What did God use when he created the world? How much material did God have? What did he use? Nothing, right? God spoke the world into existence. And if God can speak the world into existence, God can take these lowly, lowly bodies that we have and transform them into glorious bodies that will be suited for heaven. Amen? Amen. Now, as we look at verses 39 all the way to verse 49, Paul is going to explain the difference of, two of the two bodies. We have a human earthly body that we are living in right now and the body that we will get as it is transformed into the glorious body. He says that he's going to contrast these two different bodies. In verse 39, he says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another flesh of fish, and another of birds. And so he's trying to point out to the Corinthians that you already see this in nature, that different animals have different kinds of flesh from different flesh than that of humans. It's not all the same. And so it's not strange or bizarre for God to recreate a kind of flesh that is suited for glory, but he can't use the same, he can't let this flesh go into heaven. As you look down in verse 50, it says, Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. God cannot allow this flesh, the one that we have now, go into heaven, but he has to recreate a new flesh, one that is suited for heaven. And he's pointing out to him that there's already different kinds of flesh that you already know. Verse 40 and 41. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies. So there's heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Verse 41, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differs from another star in glory. And so he's trying to point out the difference, the difference this, that the body that we have right now is not to be looked upon as though it is not glorious, not something that God values. 
God values our bodies that we have right now. They are suited for this life. They are fearfully and wonderfully made. God wants us to use our bodies for His glory and His honor. There's a certain glory to our earthly bodies that we have right now. But there's also another kind of body that He's going to create for us. A glorious body that is suited for heaven. Now, Mormons, Mormons take these verses right here, verses 40 and 41, and they teach that there are different, different levels of glory in heaven. It's kind of interesting that the Mormons take chapter 15 and, and have different bizarre teachings that are out there. They take that, um, the phrase that we looked at last week about verse 29, what will, the, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise? Why are they baptized for the dead? They take that verse and make it to mean something. And they also take these verses right here, verses 40 and 41, to teach that there are different levels of glory in heaven. That, that if you serve the Lord, you're, you're going to be in one level because you are more faithful. And then ones who are below you will be down here in different levels of glory depending on your faithfulness. So that's not even the, what the context is teaching. It's just comparing two different types of bodies. The body that we have now with the body that we will have when God gives us a new glorious body. And as you look at verse 42, this is, his, this is his conclusion. And so he says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. Our bodies are going to be different. And then from, verses, from verse 42 all the way down to verse 49, he's going to give us four different contrasts for us to understand what kind of body we're going to have. It's important for us to understand the kind of body that God is going to give us. Look at verse 42. Look what, look what he highlights here again, the principle of sowing. He says, The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's going in the ground. And it is raised out of the ground in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so different contrasts that he wants us to understand between the body that we have now and the body that we will get. The first contrast that he lays out for us there is right there in verse 42 where he says the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. This is a contrast that is one of durability, one of durability. Our earthly bodies are not designed by God to last forever. They're not durable. They're perishable. They're corruptible. They will get old. We will get sick, right? And we eventually, we will die and experience death. Well, depending on your perspective, that's good or that could be bad, right? Not all of us are looking forward to death. Some of us say, hey, bring it on. I'm ready. But there's some even here today. You're not ready for that day to come. You're not ready for that day to come, but it surely will. But our new glorified bodies are different. They're designed by God to last forever. Our new glorified bodies, they're never going to get, they're never going to die. They're never going to get tired. They're going to, it's kind of like that, Energizer bunny that keeps on going. That's the way our new bodies will never get tired. They will never get sick. They're imperishable. They're incorruptible. What a wonderful thing that God is going to do in our, with our bodies. The second contrast that he has here has to do with value and potential, where he says that it is sold in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Listen, right now, our bodies are dishonorable, meaning we have not lived up to the potential that God wants us to live up to. We've dishonored God in our bodies, have we not? We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We don't live up to the standard that God wants us to live for. We fail, and we will constantly fail because the bodies that we're living in now are dishonorable. They will fail. We will not please God the way we ought to. We have sinned in this life with our bodies. We've defiled ourselves before a holy God. But look what it says there. They're, they're, they're sown in dishonor, but they are raised in glory. 
Our new bodies will be raised in glory. Our new bodies will be able to glorify God. Our new bodies, we will be able to glorify God and please Him and live with God forever and ever, perfectly be able to please and honor the Lord, our great God and Savior for all eternity. Amen? The third contrast is one of ability. He says that it is, so, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. The bodies that we're living in right now are prone to weakness, are they not? They're prone to weakness. This is both spiritual and it is a health problem. It's both spiritual and it's a health problem. Spiritually, we lack the ability to be strong enough to, to be able to fend off or ward off the spiritual dark forces that are against our souls. That is why in Ephesians chapter 6, he says to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. In our natural bodies, the way we are, we cannot ward off the spiritual forces, nor can we withstand the temptation that comes before us. We will always fall into sin because of these bodies that we live in. They're prone to weakness. But not only is that in a spiritual problem, but it also is a health problem. Our bodies are weak in that they're prone to get weak. They're prone to get sick. No matter how healthy we try to be, our bodies will not last. But listen, you ready for this? The body that you've always wanted, God is going to give to you. The body that you've always wanted, God is going to give you someday. The power of the resurrection it is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. The power of the resurrection will be totally ours someday. Right now, we experience the power of the Holy Spirit living in our lives. As we yield to the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit we can experience to some degree this power that He's talking about. But we, we're not perfect yet. Someday, we'll be given a new glorious body. What we know right now in part, we shall know completely. We will be raised in power, no more weakness, no more sickness, no more death. Amen? The last contrast is somewhat self-explanatory. He, he says it twice. He says that it is sown, na- the body, there, the, 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 it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so what he's talking about here, he's contrasting the natural and the spiritual. These natural bodies that we have right now are only suited for this life. They're natural. They're earthly. God designed our bodies to, to, en- to enjoy Him in this life. It's a wonderful life that He's given. They're, our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made, but they're only suited for this life. But He contrasts that with the glorious body, the spiritual body that He is going to give, for, give to us someday. And that glorified body, which right now, our natural bodies, we, we have the Holy Spirit living in us, right? Someday, the new glorious body is going to be perfect, and we're all, they're going to be joined together with, with our spirit and a total package, total package, glorified body with, with the presence of God, the Holy Spirit living in us, what a wonderful day that God is going to do in our lives, giving us, giving us a spiritual body that is designed by God to last forever and ever and to be with Him and to enjoy heaven. Now, in verses 45 through 49, the last contrast He's going to give here, He's going to contrast our life in Adam to our life in Christ our life in Adam to our life in Christ. Let me read these words. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. This is a reference to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, in which after God created the man, what did he do? He breathed into him, and the man became a living soul, a living being. And then he says here that that's the first man, Adam. He became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And all those who have Christ in their life, you've been given life because He is a life-given Spirit. And then He just gives uh, the order 
okay? In verse 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. And this makes sense to us because we're born into this world in Adam. He, he, is, our, he is our federal head, as the, theologians say. Everything that pertains to Adam pertained to us when we, we were born into this world. And that is why Jesus says in John chapter 3, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot enter the kingdom of God. We need to be born again. We are born in Adam. Everything that Adam did, you read Romans chapter 5 about how Adam, Adam's sin was, was passed on to all of us. And then in Christ, everything about Christ, all of His righteousness, everything about Christ, those who are in Christ, everything that pertains to Christ pertains to you. Everything that happens to Christ is going to happen to you and I. We are in Christ. What a wonderful contrast. I'll continue reading. He says, the first man was of the earth, made of the dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, Adam, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. Everything that pertained to Adam pertains to those who are in Adam still and those who are in Christ. Everything that pertained to Christ will also pertain to you. And he clarifies that in verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So, just as it was with the first man, Adam, so shall it be the last man, Christ, in everything. Just as our Lord as with our Lord are our bodies, which, were now per- which are now perishable, dishonored, weak, and natural, they will be raised into new glorious bodies, imperishable, glorious, powerful, and spiritual. And as with our new resur- resurrected bodies, listen to this, that which hinders our service in the manifestation of God will now be gloriously change because we will be given new bodies. So what kind of bodies will we have? And as we consider what our new resurrected bodies will be like, we are told they'll be like who? They will be like Christ, right? They will be like Christ. And so, listen to this. From Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, meaning after he died, he was buried, and he rose again in the third day. What did Jesus do? For 40 days, he revealed himself to his disciples. We read about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. All those different appearances and, and the way he did things. If we examine the resurrected Christ and, and the things that he did while he was on the earth for those 40 days, that will give you and I some kind of indication of what kind of body that resurrect, resurrected body is going to be. And so, We get an idea of the greatness, the power, and the wonder of what our own resurrected bodies are going to be. What did Jesus do? Well, at times, Jesus appeared to his disciples, and then he disappeared. How would you like to do that? He appeared, and then he disappeared. He was able to walk through walls and go through closed doors, was he not? And yet, he could also eat and drink sit down and talk. And he even was seen by those that he wanted them to see him. He was able to do all those things. And so he was remarkably the same and yet even remarkably different. That's Jesus. And that's the resurrected body that he has. And that's the body that we're going to have. And so this is what Paul is trying to get all of us to take away from this. Just as Christ And His glorious body, that's the body that God is going to create for you and me, just like Christ. And so, what do we read in Matthew 13, 43? When the end comes, listen to this. Then the righteous, every follower of Christ, every believer in Christ, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, Let them hear the great transformation that will take place because of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. 
the righteous will shine forth as the sun. Think of the glory that you'll have someday in the, the new body that God creates for you. Paul says to us in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, For our citizenship is in heaven. Our home is in heaven. Where we belong is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. That's what we're doing right now. We're waiting. In Romans chapter 8, he talks about the same thing. The creation is waiting. Every follower of Christ is waiting, waiting for this redemption to take place. We've been redeemed, but we haven't experienced the full redemption that is waiting for us. Glory. We wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's he going to do? Who will transform our lowly, earthly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. So what kind of body are we going to have? The same body that Jesus had. Now, I, I'll be honest with you. This is still a mystery. And that's what he says there in verse 51. It's still a mystery. We understand to a certain degree what kind of body we're going to have. But let me tell you something. I would, I would venture to argue that the body that Christ has right now in heaven is a little different than what he had on this earth. Amen? And listen, God is going to give every follower of Christ a new glorious body. Why can he do that? It is according to the work and by which even, even he is able to subdue all things himself. What does he mean by that? His power. God is powerful enough to transform these lowly bodies into a glorious body. Now, knowing all this, I want to end with this statement from John MacArthur. The coming resurrection is the hope and motivation of the church of all, for all believers. Again, the coming resurrection is the hope and motivation of the church and of all believers. Whatever happens to our present bodies, whether they are healthy or unhealthy, beautiful or plain, short-lived or long-lived, whether they are indulged or tortured, they are not our permanent bodies, and we should therefore not hold on to them too dearly. Our blessed hope and assurance is that these created natural bodies will one day be recreated as spiritual bodies. And although we have only a glimpse of, the, of what those new bodies will be like, it should be enough. It should be enough to know that we shall be like Him. In 1 John chapter 3, He says that everyone who has this hope in Him of having this new, resurrected, glorified body Everyone who has this hope in them purifies themselves just as he is pure. And so knowing that someday we who know the Lord shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, that person that you are right now is going to be gloriously changed. Does that mean we sit back and just don't do anything and just say, well, it's going to come. Why should I bother? No. Everyone who has this hope in them purifies themselves. It is a motivation. It is a motivation to live for the Lord and to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because God is working in you, right? That which is going to come out of you. God wants to work in you that which is going to come out. Glorify the Lord even in the body that you have now. It's important to the Lord. As we close in a word of prayer, I want to remind everybody here that as you sit here, you are either in Adam or you're in Christ. You're in Adam if you've never turned from your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never humbled yourself and realized that you're a sinner on your way to hell because you've sinned against God. And if God gives you what you deserve, you're just dust. You're going to return to the dust. Ten out of ten people die. You'll face God and have to, have to give an account of the way you lived your life. You've sinned. God is going to judge you someday. You're in Adam. But right now where you're sitting, 
you can be taken out of Adam and be placed in Christ. And whatever happens to Christ will happen to you. You'll be given a new resurrected body that you'll be able to enjoy heaven forever and ever. Don't you want that? Don't you want that? God wants that for you too. And as we close in prayer, bow your heads. And if you're not sure you have it, if you're not longing for that and waiting for it, would you tell God you want to be saved today and give your life to the Lord Jesus? Bow your heads, close your eyes, and consider this wonderful truth. Father, I thank you and praise you for the wonderful gift of eternal life. And I lift my voice for each person that is here today. And I ask that you would open each person's eyes to this wonderful truth of the resurrection, that one day we will be raised from the dead and be given a new glorious body that shall be able to be with you forever and ever. I pray that you will have your way in all of our hearts, and that you would prepare our hearts today to worship you, to worship you as we gather around the Lord's table and remember what Jesus has done for us this day. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If I could be of any spiritual help to you today because of what you might have heard, um, please come and speak to me and I will assist you in the scriptures and help you understand what God has done for you in Christ. I would like to prepare our hearts now for the Lord's Supper. Um, if you're visiting with us, we, we, uh, every, every, every month, the first Sunday of every month, we worship the Lord around the Lord's Supper. He, he commanded the church to um, remember what He has done in His death, burial, and resurrection. And so every believer in Christ, everyone who knows their sins have been forgiven, they're able to come to this table. They're invited to come to this table and celebrate their forgiveness and celebrate what God has done for them in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And tell, so he tells us to gather and to partake of the Lord's Supper because of what he's done for us. And so if you're here today and you know the Lord, enjoy it. If you don't know for sure your sins are forgiven, it's okay to let the, the plate pass you. 